I'm willing to bet that most of you feel the same way I do about how 2020 is going so far. It's not been my favorite year for a long time for a lot of reasons. We've seen so much this year. We've seen rioting. We've seen looting and destruction of our cities. We've seen a global pandemic that's killed thousands in our country, many more around the world. That's also shut down our nation and crippled our economy, wiped out many family businesses. And that, in turn, has led to a lot of suffering in families and our communities. We've also seen crime spiking in many communities, as has depression and drug abuse and domestic violence and other vices all this year. We've seen criminals being glorified, and we've seen heroes being vilified as their statues get torn down and defaced. And now we have so-called experts in medicine and law and economics and criminal justice and social justice, and they're all disagreeing with one another about the costs and benefits of simply getting us back to normal. For the first time in our American lives, I know at least for me, we were banned from our own churches and from receiving the sacraments and even from visiting our own family members. We've seen political divisions so far, and I don't even think it's, it's barely got started. We've seen political divisions like we've, we've never seen in our lifetimes that has further ripped Americans apart and separated us from one another. So, to make sense out of all of this, we do what we have always done. We turn to the media for answers. We're looking for modern-day Walter Cronkites that we can look to and trust us, trust to tell us the truth, to sort out all of the confusing flood of sound bites and to fulfill their constitutional duty to keep us informed without bias. But we've also come to the realization that we're being routinely lied to and deliberately misinformed by those entrusted with this duty. We're living in the most information-rich age in human history, and we're starving for the truth. Sadly, even, there's, even certain figures within our own Catholic Church have betrayed us in recent years. But we can always be sure that the message of the proclaimed word that is only fulfilled in our Catholic Church is always truthful. And the church calls this the charismatic mission of the church. It's the underlying seed of the, God's word that allows the works of Christ to flourish on earth, all because we proclaim and live his truth. But through all of that, we know that the truth of Christ is forever unchanging, because truth must be unchanging. Truth cannot become a lie, and a lie cannot become the truth. We have a church that is, in its very essence, his body. Sometimes we mistreat that body but the body is still the body of Christ. We do not exist as a church, brothers and sisters, so that we might meet here once a week as members of the La Plata chapter of the first century Jewish Carpenters Club. That's not what we're doing here. We're here because the man of Jesus Christ walked among us and saved us by being the truth, by being the light and the way. And we are now tasked with changing the world in his name. That's why he was here. He saved us, and then he sent us. That's what apostles were, apostolain, the Greek word to be sent, all right? He left, he sent us the Holy Spirit, and said, now you go and complete the mission. Go and evangelize to the whole world. Not for us to be changed by the world, but for us to change the world. That's our mission. We have to remember that. The world and its lies are the problem. Christianity and its sacraments are the solution. And that's what Christ meant in the similes of salt and light. Salt gives flavor to the world, as we must. Light is to overcome the darkness, as we must. This week, you may have seen in the news that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, reportedly said something to an interviewer during the production of a documentary film that made the internet explode. Um, actually, as I found out, he had, uh, Pope Francis said these comments, I think about a year ago, and a clip from that interview was now being used in this new documentary. So that might be why the words attributed to him were so confusing as they were reported to us, because we don't know what to believe when we see it in the press. So he said these words in Spanish, and I actually found the clip, and I speak Spanish, and I saw it, and I said, you know what, that's exactly the translation as we're seeing reported was was good. It was, it, was, it was what he said. But I didn't see the before and I didn't see the after. If true, what he said 
would essentially upend centuries of dogmatic teaching in the church. So the phrase, as we received in the press, was, homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. You can't kick someone out of a family, nor make their life miserable for this. What we have to have is a civil union law. That way they are legally covered. Now we know from past situations that the words of the Holy Father have sometimes been taken out of context or confused in translation. There's even one notable interview he gave to an interviewer who didn't take notes. He doesn't believe in notebooks, and it didn't come out exactly the way the Pope said it. And I can tell you from what I've seen online that it appears the same thing is sort of happening here. The translation is right, but the context is all wrong. First of all, any fundamental change in church teaching would not come in the form of a comment or a news clip or something the Pope says on an airplane. It's going to come in the form of an encyclical or some kind of apostolic letter. This is something that a lot of thought and prayer and discernment goes into before it happens. That didn't happen this time. The media instead saw this as an opportunity to announce that the Pope is now endorsing same-sex civil unions. That didn't happen either. Despite anything you might have read in the news, let me tell you about the unchanging truth of the Catholic Church. Some might tell you that it has been the practice and belief of the Catholic Church to persecute homosexuals. And this is an evil caricature of the truth. As you know, a caricature is the twisted, distorted view of reality that turns something beautiful into something grotesque. And that, unfortunately, is sometimes the preferred view people have of the Catholic Church. The Church has a very clear and compassionate view of homosexuals, and it makes a distinction between people and their actions. Homosexuals in our church are, as the Pope says, our brothers and sisters. We acknowledge all people for their individual identity and not for a group that they identify being in. We see people as the individuals made in the image of God. That is, that is essential in, in our view as Catholics and as Christians of every other human being. They do indeed belong to our family, as the Pope said, and they belong right here. Nobody, not a lay Catholic, or a deacon, or a priest, or even an archbishop, can ever say that anyone, straight or gay, because of a perceived sin they may or may not have committed, does not belong within the walls of the Catholic Church. If not in a church, then tell me where does a sinner belong? This is where all Christians come to humble themselves before their Heavenly Father. And the rest of us should welcome them, because we are sinners too. Our first reading today in Exodus tells us, You shall not molest or oppress an alien, for you were once aliens yourselves in the land of Egypt. So what does this mean to us? Egypt, in this sense, means the wilderness, the state of being exiled because of our sin. It's where sin sends us. In Leviticus, I think it's chapter 6, don't, it's in Leviticus, there's a scene where the, the, the priests take two goats and they put the, sin, the sins of the people on one goat and they send it out into the wilderness. That's where we get the term scapegoat. And, and he goes out to the wilderness where he's essentially consumed by wild animals. That is, this, that's what it means for us. Sin consumes us and it sends us out. It puts us in bondage and sends us out to be consumed by, by evil. Jesus paid that price so that we wouldn't have to, have to be that scapegoat. But Exodus today may as well be, be saying to us, you shall not molest or oppress the sinner, for you were once sinners yourselves when you were pagans. And over the years, especially in my, in my previous parish when I was very active in RCIA, I saw many people, but even here as well, I've seen many people who were broken, lost, and mired in sin. And it was my joy to be here on the Easter Vigil to see them being received into, in baptism and confirmation, and then finally in the Mass to see them receive the Eucharist that they were desperately waiting to receive for so long. Many of them have such incredible stories. You know it's just only by the grace of God that their feet brought them into this church. But if we didn't have that passage from Exodus and they walked in, would we welcome them? We have to welcome them. Because we are the salt and the light. We have to bring Christ's hope to those in bondage of sin because that same hope was brought to us. And our priests can tell you that when they hear confessions, they hear many more of these stories of people who are lost and mired in sin, shackled in, in the bondage of, of, of the slavery of sin, who are liberated by it by leaving their sins at the foot of the cross. 
People don't go into a confessional to argue with the priest about the holiness of their sins, but to reject their sins because they know that they offend God and that they offend the people of God. So why should anyone believe that Catholics do not accept homosexuals in the church? I can assure you that our tradition and our catechism tells us that the proper term, the proper Catholic term for a homosexual is a child of God. That's not my take on it, that's the gospel truth. Where we have to depart from, our, from many progressives in our culture is not with the acceptance of individuals, these individuals I'm speaking of, who are all uniquely made in God's image, but accepting that baggage that we all bring with us. Sins are objective. Something's not a sin to me that's not a sin to you. It's a sin to God. It either is or it is not. Sins are objective. And they offend God and they offend the body of Christ. We have to reject sin. There is no path to holiness without that being the first step. Rejecting sin. And we fall and we get back up. We go to the confessional. But we have to reject the notion of sin. Certain sinful behaviors have got to go from our lives. It offends God and it betrays the faithful if we let ourselves believe that secular 21st century views of morality is somehow in line with God's teaching. It is not. No matter what words the Pope may or may not have said, under no circumstances can homosexual actions be approved. Our catechism says this, I quote, basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as acts of grave depravity, Tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. They close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine, effective, and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstances can they be approved. That teaching has been the teaching of the church at all times in its history. But now we have an unlistening, chattering class of our society that loves to distort the truth to take something beautiful and make it grotesque. It wants to make you believe that the church regards homosexual people as depraved and disordered. And I've seen that characterized that way several times, that the church considers homosexual people to be depraved and disordered. The church does not teach that, and it never has. But the church has been very clear on the distinction. Just like your sins and my sins, everyone's sins are sins. And as such, they are immoral and depraved and disordered. To prove the distinction, the Catechism goes on to say, homosexual persons are called to chastity by the virtues of self-mastery that teach them inner freedom, at times by the support of disinterested friendship, by prayer and sacramental grace, they can and should gradually and resolutely approach Christian perfection. So in case you missed that last part, let me say it again. They can and should gradually and resolutely approach Christian perfection. Brothers and sisters, our church is telling us, our Lord is telling us that his homosexual daughters and sons are called to sainthood. They are not rejected. They're not being told to leave. This has been our belief forever. We all struggle with the sins we are all inclined to commit but those sins do not diminish God's love for us, so neither should the church. But we, we must also heed the words of our gospel reading today. The Lord is speaking to the Pharisees, who again are trying to trip him in his words, as they always are and always fail. They ask him what the greatest commandment is. He tells them, as he tells us, that we must love our neighbor as ourselves, which was clearly reflected in the Pope's words this week. He probably had this very passage in mind when he said it. Christ tells us that the entire law and the prophets depend on it. That means we welcome everyone through those doors. Our evangelization efforts are how we actively invite them. We make them understand that this is where they belong, not because they're perfect already, but because they're reaching for perfection, and that the Son of God died for them as much as he died for the rest of us. But the first part of Christ's answer is the most critical part. It's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, the prayer called the Shema Yisrael, which Jews pray every single day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole being and with your whole strength. That means the Lord is telling us, 
the same thing. We might change the words a little bit. It might sound like this. Here, O Christians, the Lord is our God, not the secular culture. You shall love the Lord above all things and reject your sin with your whole heart and with your whole being and with your whole strength. When Christ rose and was sent into heaven, he sent the paraclete. He sent the Holy Spirit to give us this strength, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, to give us this strength to persevere through these things that are difficult. Remember that you were fashioned of his own divinity and made in his image. And you will not attempt to fashion God out of your sinfulness and make him in your image. That's idolatry. You honor God when you are humble before him, accepting fault for your sins. Now, I certainly hope you can see that I am not here today to condemn homosexual people or to condemn the Pope for his comments, but to clarify our immutable and unchangeable position on this topic, regardless of what the Holy Father may or may not have said. That's inconsequential. The truth of Christ is eternal. It has been mis mischaracterized, abused, and rejected by all of us at one time or another throughout our lives and throughout our history. But those are our sins, not Christ's mistake. There's one passage in, in I think, 1 Corinthians that I love when Paul says, we hold this vessel, we hold this, this treasure in earthen vessels, this beautiful treasure of the church we hold in our, in our grubby, dirty hands. Why? Because that's the way God wanted it. And we're going to drop it and damage it and ding it up, but that doesn't make it less holy. It just means we got to get better at how we handle the, this, this treasure that's been given to us. Homosexuality is a sin, and civil unions are inadmissible. A civil union between either heterosexual or homosexual couples undermines marriage and exposes both parties to the frequent occasion of sin. The Pope knows this, and he knows it would be supremely unchristian to encourage such a thing. If you are heterosexual, the same rules apply. If you are living with your boyfriend or girlfriend, it's a sin. Call mom and see if the bedroom back home is still available. Civil unions between homosexual couples further complicates the idea of adoptive parenthood. And that's where some people this week thought they heard the, the, the Holy Father changing our, our, our teaching in the church. The church has explicitly taught that a child deserves a mother and a father. Some have said that his words were, were uh, in acceptance of adoptions by same-sex couples. He did not say that. And he is on record many times, having said in the past, that the church strongly opposes this, as he does personally. Law does exist, and should exist, to protect homosexual people from persecution, especially in places where they are targeted for persecution or violence. Never, at any time in history, if that happened, was it ever sanctioned. That is a sin. Our civilization was very late in acknowledging this, and that is our sin and our legacy that we must atone for. But no law is just that enshrines sin as a virtue. So in closing, I want to remind everyone that we're not meant to be ignorant of the changing times. We don't lock ourselves in our church cocoon and forget that the world is spinning around out there changing all the time. We have to be aware of that. Remember, we're the salt and the light. We have to know where the darkness is. We have to know where the salt is needed. We have to be aware of what's changing in our, in our society. To do so would be a huge detriment to, to, all, to all involved, to us, to the, to the world. We're on a mission. We're on a mission from God. We're here to change the world. But we, we see the changes in our secular culture, and we have to know where to apply that, that, that grace that, 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 that Christ gave us that works through our hands and through our words. Several years ago, there was a, uh, uh, a mini-series produced by HBO, which uh, I have the box set. It's wonderful. It's called From the Earth to the Moon. And it chronicled the space race of the 1960s. I've seen it a bunch of times. I love watching it. And the opening sequence of every episode, there's a, there's a, whole, bunch, a whole montage of different clips and everything from the 60s. And there's this one little piece of President Kennedy saying, in his Boston accent, which I won't do, we choose to go to the moon in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. So again, I, I, I heard him say that, I don't know how many episodes there were, many, many times, so it kind of sinks in, right? 
And that speech, the entire speech he gave, motivated an entire nation to commit to this seemingly impossible goal, which they actually did reach. I think it was like 450,000 Americans were employed one way or another in putting a man on the moon and bringing him back home again. The company that I worked for, my own company, was the one that built the lunar lander right in my hometown in New York. It's still something that my company is very proud of that they were involved in. So I can take that and I can turn that around a little bit too. Brothers and sisters, we choose to go to heaven, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. We have been chosen for that mission. We are the salt and the light. We preach a difficult message. We witness to a difficult message. And what's the word for witness in Greek? Martyrios, martyr. We are called to martyrdom. Hopefully, God willing, not to a death, but to suffer for Christ. Through the ministry we, we live, through the, the way we preach, through the, the, through the way we show compassion to others. That's our martyrdom. That is our witness. We're called to that. We're not, it's just not allowed for us to be passive and to find a little cubbyhole and wait for the world to spin by us. We're the ones called to go out there and change the world. You cannot extend love to someone if you do not also offer them the truth. To love is to tell the truth. Our homosexual brothers and sisters belong where all the rest of us are. We acknowledge we commit sins, and this is what the church is for. They are always welcome here. 